Now then, you're welcome along to the football show. Ooh, interesting times at Hampden Park. Scotland nil, Ukraine two. Yarmolenko twice, either side of half time. It must be said, for much of the first half, Ukraine the better side. They had a number of chances, two very good chances. Gordon and the Scottish goal made some good saves and then two half chances and ultimately they went direct and it was a fine finish from Yarmolenko under the circumstances. Side footed the ball, over goalkeeper, 1-0 up and then a header in the 49th minute started the second half. So suddenly uh, we are at crisis point for the Scots and their bid to make the World Cup. In the finalissima, there are 55 minutes gone. Italy nil, Argentina 2 is where we are. The European champions against the Copa America champions. The inaugural finalissima, grand final at Wembley. Uh, meanwhile, in the Nations League, League A Group 4, Poland 2, Wales 1 is a full-time result. Wales, of course, will play the winners at Hampden Park on Sunday. Now, with the season pretty much wrapped up, certainly the club season wrapped up, we thought we would have something of a state of the nation conversation uh, for you 53106 the text number any questions whatsoever fire them in you will also get us at off the ball as ever on Twitter very happy to say we are joined by Matt Slater of The Athletic Matt great to have you with us this evening Hi how are you? Very well Graeme Hunter good evening Joseph baby going to be a hell of a comeback 3-2 Sorry Joe I, did you understand my Ukrainian there? <laughs> you know I'm Ukrainian eh? Deep down I know you are yeah well, we all are this evening. I mean, ordinarily, I'd be supporting your boys. I like it. I like, I like where you're taking this. Thank you, Joseph. Mm. Thank you. What have you made of the game thus far? No, look, well, two things really stand out. They, they have worked out a tactic when playing the ball out from the back that is very, very easily opening Scotland up. Uh, their passes are quick and accurate. They, they, you know, the, the disadvantage they have as a squad where... The majority, not all of them, the majority of them haven't played competitively since November, has somewhat been eroded by the fact that, you know, this is the second point that I've noticed, that Scotland are um, almost to a man that little bit more sluggish and slower. The type of play you get um, when a wearing, tearing season has had then about two weeks downtime and, and players are not at their, their sharpest. Scotland have looked... A little bit like ripe peaches being opened up by kitchen knives. And genuinely, Ukraine have played with complete strategic intelligence. It's been a really clever approach on how to drag Scotland apart and then use intelligent passes to create the vast majority of the chances. I think I think the visitors have had maybe seven efforts on target. I'm not sure Scotland have won yet. And the boys in blue look a little bit sluggish and Ukraine look quite good. And... You know, the, the truth of it is we just had one on target right now um, from Ryan Christie. But it's it's a night where Scotland have been second best in terms of pace, uh, mental sharpness and noticeably strategy. To reflect on the season which is just wrapped up, Matt, we might start with the Champions League for a moment. Real Madrid, once again, Kings of Europe. The Champions League knockout stages continue to enthrall most of us can remember watching the Man City Real Madrid game. Most of us can remember watching Real Madrid full stop in the knockout stages. Uh, there is something about this competition, despite attempted European Super League. Once it gets to the knockout stages, there is a certain magic to it still. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, some of the group stages can be a bit dull. This has been, you know, a a complaint for about the last 20 years. But um, yeah, as soon as you get to the last 16, and you know, you've sorted a lot of the weight from the chaff, uh, proper knockout football, it's a, it's a compelling offer, lots of jeopardy, best players in the world, best managers. It's great. It's a winning formula. Why mess with it? It's really good. I like it. Did we miss away goals, Graham? You know, it, it's, it surprised me. I, I'll, I'll touch and pass away from, you know, Matt said something that I hear a lot from, from people in Britain, and I'm willing to accept that I might be out of step, but I have never, ever, ever found the group stages um, boring. I know it's a constant refrain, so there may be a, a point of meeting. And and one of the things that, again, I, I seem to be out of step with, although I think it's one where we wait a little bit. I remember being in Neon at UEFA's base, Listening into the the session where the elite coaches uh, were, it was a planning session. It wasn't a public session. I 
I can't remember why I was given access to it, but, you know, very important managers of the last 25, 30 years were consistently saying it's it's not right, it's not fair, it has to change. I remember at the time being very hostile to that idea. And, and part of that, uh, Joe, was that, you know, I, I don't know if at your age or the age of your listeners, people remember the European Cup in its worst format or in its worst face that it showed to the world. When teams thought a nil-nil draw away was absolutely magical, when a lot of the football was absolutely stultifying. And Matt talking about the, the Champions League still being a magical competition, still being one that's uplifting and you picking up memories from this season. Across my working lifetime, the Champions League has utterly revolutionised how teams think about playing away from home. So because almost every footballer now, thanks to the youth league, gets used to playing in all different climates, um, travelling to different time zones, sometimes playing on slightly different surfaces if you go very far east in the winter, um, playing in front of lots of different referees. It, it now, and for some time, teams, particularly any team that repeatedly qualifies for the Champions League, plays away from play away from home with almost the same confidence and verve and attacking idea as they do at home. So I was really hostile to the idea of removing the incentive to play attacking football away from home. And I put this forward to Roberto Martinez in an interview I had with him one on one two and a half weeks ago. And he was he was very much against what I was saying. He he genuinely thought that there had been an unfairness and an imbalance. And this season it's clear that if you only judge on the evidence of this season's knockouts, my fears are unfounded. I don't think, I think there will be a gradual erosion. I think we will begin to see much more speculative, much more defensive football from teams away from home who now don't have an incentive to attack, particularly, say, in a in a first leg. I think if there was, a, if there was, what do you call it, when you, when you slightly change something, if there was a retouch to do, then maybe it was... No away goals in the extra time mm. part of the the second leg, but Joe, it, mm. I, I, you're right. If if I was to make a hullabaloo about it now, I, I could be laughed down on this season. My watchword would be wait and see. And Graham, what about domestic football across Europe in the big leagues, for instance? So, from a Premier League point of view, which I suspect is the football that Matt and I predominantly uh, watch weekend to weekend. In France, PSG, 15-point winners. Don't suspect that's going to change anytime soon, the exception of last year notwithstanding. Bayern, 8-point winners, 10 in a row. Madrid, 13-point winners. Barcelona very much in that rebuilding uh, phase. Is it a worry that we're not seeing very vibrant title races across these big leagues or uh, cyclical or what's your take on it? Yeah, I, I I think that to give you a proper answer, you need to probably take in five or six seasons and project and imagine two or three ahead. Um, clearly, again, based just on what you said there, it doesn't feel all that healthy yet. For example, you said in the league that you and Matt cover most, in the league I cover most, um, there were Villarreal only scraping into this season's Conference League via qualification. And they were 45 good minutes away from the Champions League final. Last season, they only qualified for the Champions League by winning the Europa League. And it would be my contention that in, in Spain, we're in a slightly unusual time. And what's happening with the infamous Sort of financial fair play that Javier Tebas is imposing is that over his reign as head of La Liga, the financial disparity has been uh, has been closed a little bit, and I think that will ultimately be healthy for the league I work in. And what's more, I do believe that we are still distinctly in a time where the the ripples in the pond of the lockdown and the pandemic are still being felt, particularly for the medium sized clubs. And, you know, in, in, in Italy, for example, to, to quote one of the places that you, you pulled out, there was a time when you, you, we just, you, you close your eyes and, and people in zebra stripe strips won the title. Mm. And for the last two seasons, we've had Inter and then Milan back 
with a Napoli competing very strongly. As you pointed out, Paris Saint-Germain did not win their domestic league last season. Um, I, I, I think there are patent imbalances and there are patently a handful of clubs who can afford to stockpile talent and to pluck. It's like you have fishing seasons and you don't want to go fishing when you know the, the, the catch that you want to land is still too junior. I think a lot of that goes on across Europe, whereby players who are emerging are now taken away from their domestic league too soon. Yeah. So yes, there's an imbalance and yes, there are things to correct. But I, I, my point of view is I don't think we're in, a, in an emergency care situation okay. across European domestic football. OK, fair point. And actually, it was a complete oversight of me not to mention Milan, two points winners against Inter. So that constitutes a very lively and very good title race. Mal, I wanted to ask you about uh, the movement of players now. We're certainly in the era of super clubs and increasingly, given the money at stake, we are in the era of super players. So Mbappe, free agent and signs for that very lucrative signing on bonus at PSG. We have somebody like Erling Haaland who negotiated that low buyout clause and will reap the rewards now of uh, his salary at Manchester City. We have Mo Salah announcing as I think expecting everybody to, to be thrilled that he's staying on for one more season, which I think in old money is I'm running down my contract. We have Paul Pogba, who has run down his contract. I wonder, are we starting to reach a new stage where footballers realise that all this money is swirling around? Why should transfer fees go between clubs? There was a time when Sol Campbell going to Arsenal on a free was quite the scandal in part because it was Arsenal, but also in part because it was on a free and it was greed. Now, really, it just seems if you're a top player, it's just good business to sign a three or four year contract and run it down, frankly. I wonder, are we going to see this as the new way business is done amongst the real elite players? Yes, I do. Um, this has been coming for a while. There's been, I've written about this, the end of the transfer fee. You know, why do we have transfer fees? It's, it's, it's remarkable. Only really football has them. Um, you know, if you think about it, it's a complete restraint of trade. You or I would be absolutely furious if we were blocked from moving to a rival, to a competitor for, for a better offer, for a better job. Uh, and, you know, our current employer demanded compensation. So it's it's a weird anomaly. And there are so many. It's one of many. Add it to the pile. Um, but I think uh, the top players and their agents have rumbled it. They've worked it out. And um, I think there are a couple of things going on here. One, you've got the sort of the contractual element to it, and the uh, and that's I think has just sort of worked its way through the legality of it. But I think there's a sort of second and um, wider and bigger and deeper thing going on, and that is just the rise of the individual, yeah. and uh, the fact that we are now in an era where Nike, Adidas, Puma, those guys are moving money away from team sponsorships to individual sponsorships. And we see this across a range of sports. Uh, and we're also going to a smaller stable of stars as well. It's, you know, a bit like the book industry, where there are millions of books published and only a few really make any money. So uh, a lot of various, various sort of economic trends going on here. Um, but yet uh, the best players, I think, are going increasingly uh, do this. And the signing on fee is is the new transfer fee. Um, you know, with the Mbappe case, it's really interesting. That'll be amortised across three years. So it is effectively like a transfer fee. Um, uh, but I think the kind of, the, 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 the one I think is more interesting is just this individual versus team. And that there are certain players, and you can see that in the following that players have, the bump that clubs get when they sign a certain player. Uh, there's going to be a lot of conversations around image rights. I know that was one of the issues with Mbappe. So yeah, look, there's 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 various strands. There's plenty of things for me to write about. Mm. But you're absolutely right. I think the transfer fee, as we've known it for the last 20, 30, 40 years, is is very very slowly on its way out. Yeah, it seemed Graham always odd to me that players wouldn't run down their contracts more because it would be so lucrative in previous generations it was almost like a kind of social pressure you know like you bloody will sign a contract or else you know and you'll be ostracized all season whereas now if enough players are doing it it will just uh, become the norm and become very lucrative very quickly do you anticipate this to become a new norm so one of the reasons you keep having me back is that you're really patient i may be a bit slow on this mentally but uh, you know i want to put my foot on the ball a little bit i remember for example 
And Larson at Celtic running his contract down because Celtic begged him to stay and not go for a transfer fee and paid him a million euros, a million pounds in those days to stay. And the fans loved him. I remember Robert Pires running his contract down at Arsenal um, and departing, having played brilliantly and extremely loved and, and choosing Villarreal um, to go to. And I don't dispute anything that either of you have said, um, but, but judge, not, not acting as a pundit, but judging from players I meet in La Liga and those that I get to know, one of the impressions I get is that many, many high-level players, not maybe the absolute Mbappe cream and Neymar of this world that you've been talking about, but still elite-level footballers, value where am I playing? Where will I be playing next season? Am I part of a, a project that I really adore? Do I trust the coach? Do I like the system? Am I likely to win trophies? Am I likely to win the Ballon d'Or? And I'm not trying to say in some sort of Enid Blyton way that they are um, not mindful of money. But the ones I like are the ones who, who say, I'm going to be earning more or less the same money whether I transfer now or whether I wait for a freedom of contract. And yes, there will be a, a, a boost, a bump if I um, go to a club without um, a transfer fee. But I want control rather than stay waiting another year. And I very much remember, for example, these are intermittent cases, not a whole cohesive argument to say yes or no to your proposition, mm. Joe. But I remember Victor Valdez running his contract down a football club Barcelona going up for a catch, I think from a free kick against Celta Vigo coming down in Vigo and doing his knee. And his move to, I think it was Monaco collapsing because he, he wasn't fit, hadn't been signed. And he ended up in rehab in Germany for three quarters of a year and then playing in Belgian football to get his way back and then becoming second choice under Louis van Gaal at Manchester United. So... This whole thing about running down your contract isn't risk-free, I don't think. But also I go back to the point that some of the very good footballers I know, it, it's it's not that they think money doesn't matter, but they think, I tell you what I want. I want control now. I want to know where I'm going. I want to influence where I'm going. And I may not want to wait 12 months. So I think that if, if, you, if you, you two are talking about seismic change, and Matt used a version of this phrase himself, it might be at glacier speed, I think. And I think there will always be gigantic exceptions where a player says, I'm very... For example, I, I work with somebody who works with Antoine Griezmann, and Griezmann has said to him on a number of occasions about decisions he's made, I have more money now than I need, my family need, or my grandchildren will ever need. And that conditions his thinking about what he wants to do. Now, I think that there will remain many, many of those whose primary objective is to play at the right club or for the right coach or be competing for the right trophy or their primary objective may be to be at a club where they're absolutely sure they'll be in prime condition to win the next Copa America or World Cup or European Championship. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm only accepting this, this concept of yours very, very grudgingly. Well, we're at the nascent stages and... Obviously, yes, it's not it's not not, yes. un, not unprecedented, of course, and we're talking increasingly well. We see it. Look, Matt and I are the type that would run down our contract all day long. So, oh yes, <laughs> there are enough well, of us out there, Graham. Don't don't could, don't do uh, deny. Could don't you spare me a fiver then? Could you spare <laughs> me a fiver? <laughs> Whatever you want. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Just when you were talking there, Matt, about the um, sponsorship money and the focus going almost on players, as Scotland almost equalised, but I think it's cleared off the line. It has been cleared off the line. No, it hasn't. It's over the line. You're back, Graham. 2 1, 78 minutes in the yeah, clock. Having missed an absolute guilt edge sitter six, seven minutes ago. So. There we are. So it's. It's the Scotland story, long, Joseph. It's. Long ball. Who in. else but us could draw Ukraine in a war <laughs> situation to get through to a World Cup? Long, Never mind lose at home. Long ball in, punch clear, and then McGregor gets a foot to it, I think, and it just about creeps over the line before being hacked away. So we're at 2-1, 78 minutes. Matt, you were talking there about money and attention being on the individual as opposed to the team like never before. It strikes me it's one of the real consequences of the internet and the internet is changing our lives in so many different ways, but it's having a profound effect on football in different ways. I mean, it's funny, I look at any 
YouTube section of any conversation we have on this show and it's uh, so vitriolic regarding, you know, it doesn't actually matter which side you take or what point you make, but it almost doesn't bear um, reading after a certain point. Mm. And uh, But that aspect of football whereby the individual is a commodity all in himself and, and as popular as a team in many respects, that has been one of the consequences of the internet of the last 10 years for sure. Absolutely. More popular than teams. Yeah. Ronaldo's way more popular than, has way more followers than any of the teams he's played for. Um, and you can see the same in the States with basketball players and in, in particular. Um, so, yeah, look, this is, uh, you know, this the spirit of the age, the individual. Uh, make your own story. Uh, it doesn't really matter who you play for. But, of course, I take Graham's point. I think Graham was talking about something completely different, though, in, in with respect in that yeah of course these guys uh make decisions uh for family reasons the project um trophies um and all of those things played in the mbappe story so uh i don't i don't I, you know i think we're making sort of similar points from different directions i i you know i i genuinely think the transfer fee is gradually on its way out i think it's always been a bit of an anomaly um, and I think we are going to see more and more of what we've witnessed with Mbappe and others, where they, where they, you could say they're playing the system, but are they Not really? Mm. They, they, they were, they were given a contract, a fixed term contract. They've served that fixed term contract, and then there are they're free agents. This, this, in many ways, it's it's amazing. The real shock is that it's taken this long after Bosman to get here. Yeah. You know, I, I, saw, I, I end up I end up talking about Bosman almost in every other story I write. It, right. it, it, it changed everything. Yeah. Graham, could I ask you about that point about the internet as well and individuals being bigger than teams and clubs now talking about themselves increasingly as you will love this phrase, I'm sure, my friend, but producers of content. And that like we're only ten years in, really. I mean, if we if we go back to smartphone. 08 territory we're kind of you know again we're just at the beginning of, of all this but it's absolutely having a profound effect on football I remember talking to James Horncastle when Pirlo was hired as Juventus coach and he said look the club is not unaware and, and akin to the signing of Ronaldo the club is not unaware of how this can be uh, manipulated and played in the in their social media world so it's a very real thing it's having a very real influence no, I'm sure you have some thoughts no, on it I Okay, but okay on on James's point, and if that was part of Juventus's thinking, or if that was just his guessing, that's outright moronic. Oh, nobody says it's good. And nobody says it's good. Yeah, thing. but well, yeah, okay. Then if it's a, if I'm right that it's outright moronic, um, we've seen many ideas like okay, just let's seize one, the golden goal idea. And somebody has thought this is the time for that. We'll bring this in, and it's not generically the same as your point about the me. The, the icon, the internet. But if uh, clubs were to be making decisions based on influence or popularity, their fingers will be burned so badly so quickly that that will stop. Um, players, that's maybe a slightly different idea. But I think that... You both used phrases about things moving slowly and nascent, you said. Um, well, the nascent stage of this was, I remember phoning, when I moved to Spain in 20 years ago, I remember phoning and, and having a phone call returned by Jose Angel Sanchez, the vice president then and now of Real Madrid. And he said, our research tells us that um, the new market, by which it was a euphemism for <laughs> this will be our empire, the new markets, the, the young football nations and continents, what will, what will happen is that they will follow superstars rather than clubs, and therefore Florentino Perez's existing Galactico idea, which he believes in any way, will, be allow, will allow us to market and tie their loyalty to our brand, not because their loyalty is to our history or to our badge because they are new, nascent football fans, but to a star and that you know that lasted for five years before it collapsed and Florentino Perez had to uh, resign and then lick his wounds and come back again and they stopped the idea which is tied to, to what you're talking about although 
I understand you're talking about the internet and smartphones as accelerants. I do accept that. But they ran out of Super Galacticos to sign, mm. and that's when they went for Michael Owen. And then at the moment, they're doing quite the opposite. They're, they're signing Valverde and Rodrigo and Renier, who hasn't worked, and Vinicius and Camavinga and Tomeni, who are not coming in as superstars, who are not coming in with the, the power of attraction that you are talking about. The internet is now a super magnifying glass for. And Real Madrid, who, whether you like them, dislike them, whether you thought they were due to win last weekend in San Denis, the fact is they're European and Spanish champions for only the second time since 1958. And they've done it quite the opposite way without superstar power. They they took Alaba on a free last um, summer and they added 18-year-old Camavinga. So I'm not disputing your point, mm. but I'm again, I'm not certain that we're about to see an avalanche of absolutely revolutionary decision-making based upon marketing power and and freedom of contract and the internet and this idea, this, this not revolutionary idea as that um, individual footballers can can have such brand power that they might be attractive to football clubs. I, I genuinely believe that football clubs, while they are owned by non-Americans, um, it may be the case that American ownership will come in and say, this is how we do things in the States, and we will ram this through over the next five, six, seven years, no matter whether you or your culture or your sport like it, because they have seen success in their own market. Fair enough, that might happen. But while we remain it run by particularly presidents and, and directors of football, football criteria rather than internet power will, will still dominate. Yeah, except at Manchester United. Uh, mm, we'll exactly. take, uh... I know, that's, that's, that's <laughs> half-wittedness was dominating for, for so long under what's-his-face. I do want to talk to you about the ownership model around Europe at the moment. We have to take a very short break. So we're back in one moment with Matt Slater and Graham Hunter. This is a quasi state of the nation, end of season. Chat about a few different things. We're throwing around a few ideas. It is Scotland 1, Ukraine 2. Four minutes to go in that game. And our football show coverage and off the ball brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport and BT Sport. We are back with Matt and Graham in just one moment. Well, we're into out of time, effectively, between Scotland and Ukraine. Scotland 1, Ukraine 2 is where we are at Hampden Park. We are reflecting on the end of the 2021-22 season with Graeme Hunter and Matt Slater from The Athletic. We've been throwing around a few different ideas. Uh, one which obviously is a constant point of discussion all the way through the season is the ownership model and models that we're seeing right around the continent. So... In various guises, we have the leveraged buyouts. We have the Glazers who have been in situ for some time. We have the crowd who just bought Burnley and now with Burnley relegated to the Championship, they still have to pay back £65 million of debt, leveraged uh, debt. But that model is very much alive and well when we look at the buyout at Chelsea. We have state-run teams spending obscene amounts of money for varying reasons. We have the Saudis uh, sports washing their way to... A good reputation, it would seem, in Newcastle, uh, in spite of the fact that Richard Masters said that Newcastle owners would be removed should the Saudi state be found to be in control of the club. I'm not precisely sure what they're waiting uh, for. And then we have, I don't know, Graham. What do you call? What, what do you want to call the Real Madrids of the world? The the legacy clubs, the the the, the, the blue bloods, the it, Florentino Perez no, types, struggling to keep pace. It's ownership by proxy. Barcelona is not, but it's ownership by proxy because. Okay. Florentino Perez, a billionaire businessman, has has been so dominant and so clever that he has rejigged the statutes to talk about how many years you must have had as a socio, a member, and how much money you need to be able to put forward in order to even stand for the presidency that more or less rules out everybody except somebody of his baptising and the statutes at the moment completely rule out the idea that the club can ever be bought. But also it's he's made it into what is effectively a line of, of succession. And the one at the moment, it, it, this might not be a popular word, but the, the one I see and like best at the moment is, is, is possibly Bayern Munich, whereby there's a, there's a commercial board, there's a football board, there is and has been for a long time deep, deep, significant involvement of player legends at 
levels where mostly their contribution is appropriate because legendary status doesn't qualify you necessarily to have a brilliant business head. And there remains a really big voice, angry voice from from fan bodies. And it may not be perfect, but compared to some of the ones you've mentioned, I'm I'm pretty impressed by it. Mm. Matt, I know this is an area you, you work on and work on very closely. A whole array of ownership models and mm. motivations. So talk to us about the landscape broadly then. Well, the Premier League has always famously been agnostic in its own words to ownership models. Um, and that's kind of vaguely in line with, with sort of British approaches to business going back hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, this sort of laissez-faire approach being, I, you know, in theory, welcome to inward investment. And that that has really been, the prim, well, one of the Premier League stories, you know, um, you know, the advent of satellite TV kind of hitting hitting that moment perfectly, um, the move away from the 80s, the kind of greed that was on display at the end of the 80s, early 90s, um, the fact that, the, that the, you know, that there were some compelling figures around in the 90s, Man United sort of hit that sweet spot, they just, boom, you had Fergie, you had, you had a good team there. Um, you know, look, various, there are various sorts of things you can pick out about the Premier League story, but um, it's... It's approach to it's 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 hands off approach to ownership is 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 very much part of it, and um, you know if you, you know, there's lots of ways of kind of lots of metrics you can use. Um, I did a story recently about um, another baseball guy having a look at Norwich City. No, not Norwich City being relegated, but if you know if, if we looked at last year's table, that would be nine of the twenty that would have um, American investment. Mm. I think if we had this conversation in a couple of years' time, we'll be looking at a dozen, 13, 14. That is, that's that's the trend. That's the trend. Um, we've been through a sort of a wave of Chinese investment in Europe. That's massively receded now. They're all going home. Um, there are only so many Gulf states. No, you're not. No one wants to go against the sovereign wealth fund. So we, you know, we've picked off. We've picked off the main, main, the main Gulf states. Mm. Uh, we're waiting really for. Yeah, well, you know, Russia's out of fashion. Um, we, we're, we're looking for the next kind of part of the world that's going to create some some genuine billionaires, be it India or Africa. But at the moment, uh, the wind is blowing from the States. And there's reasons for that. Um, historically low interest rates, big wall of money, got to go somewhere. The scarcity value. Um, US sports franchises, there's a finite number of them. Um the inexorable rise of TV rights in the States has genuinely turned sports franchises into an asset class. This is the language they use. I know mm. fans hate this stuff, but mm. trust me, this is the language they use. And it is no longer, particularly in North America, you know, a fun, silly, stupid way to lose a lot of money. It is, it, it, you know, if you own an NFL franchise, it is, it's, it's a cash machine. Now, we know European football is, but what these guys are betting on is the global popularity of football. And there's, there's an element of arrogance to it. They always sort of tend to come at it, well, we think that you guys aren't doing it commercially right. We think we can do it better. Mm. And they also often, to, to go back to Graham's previous answer about their approach, um, actually, American, the most of the Americans that are buying football clubs at the moment come at it the current Real Madrid approach. They're all massively data-led. The way you're successful in North America now is not really through free agency. It's through the draft. It's through being really good at spotting talent. It's being great at talent ID and talent development. They're all convinced they can do it better than we can because they've come from this North American laboratory where it's incredibly competitive. And they're all, you know, if you you know you you win or lose on your ability to spot talent. So, um, North American money, and I. The way things are going, uh, there's going to be, I mean, Serie A is the, the one that's really interesting at the moment. There's about half a dozen, six or seven now that are North American uh, owned. I think that number will, will grow in the next 18 months to almost Premier League levels. They're doing a big bush themselves, Serie A. They've just opened a big office in New York. They were doing a massive event at the uh, one of the museums in New York last week. Uh, they're all pushing North American sports rights. They're all they're all pushing the Italian American pounds, uh, money. La Liga has been doing this. La Liga has opened offices in the states. They tried to put a game there, uh, trying to uh, 
forge links with La Liga MX. All makes complete sense. Mm. You know, the, the the biggest audience in the states is 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 for Mexican football. So you know, there's an obvious demographic there. So North America, and of course we've got the 2026 World Cup. And the really interesting thing about football, I think the the, the reason all these very smart private equity guys are taking these punts on these loss-making football clubs is it's the world's most popular sport, and yet it's not the most popular sport in the three biggest markets, China, India, and North America. Mm. You sort that out, and we're all it's gravy. Yeah, very interesting. I should mention breakaway goal right at the death, so Ukraine... 3-1 winners at Hemden Park. A huge disappointment for Scotland and very emotional scenes, as you might imagine, between the Ukraine players now and uh, their fans and there are hugs and there are some tears and uh, I'm sure a very strange uh, feeling for those players, but an extraordinary evening in so many ways at Hemden Park. Graeme, love to hear your thoughts on, on this ownership situation. We have the Americans uh, doing it very well in Liverpool and being very smart in the ways... Matt mentioned and using data and making good appointments. We have the Americans doing it very poorly in the guise of Manchester United uh, doing everything wrong. We have Bayern that you mentioned. We have the La Liga clubs, their own entity. And then we have the oil states who I suspect uh, the worry is will outspend them all. Yeah, it's it's funny. I don't want to be provocative, but you say the Glazers doing it badly. I don't think the Glazers think they're doing it badly as far as they're concerned. No, it's going just fine. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a fact. It, it's sickening for any of us who are traditionalists. It's sickening for those who saw them maintaining Ed Woodward when it was patently clear he was verging on incompetent in the role he was given at the club, not incompetent in terms of guaranteeing them the returns that they wanted. Um, very clever in terms of how he engineered that deal for them, which I think was groundbreaking in, in the UK, certainly at that size. Um, it's a big lesson if you... I, I don't know if if everybody out there is a wolf or a wolf in sheep's clothing. One of the things when I speak to the football people at Liverpool is they talk about their owners not simply being um, extremely well-organised. Or, well they talk about them being extremely well-integrated and appreciative and very quick to understand what's needed in order to make Liverpool successful in sporting terms. And, and that goes from um, scouting, investment in technology, the new training grounds, controlled investment in the markets, in the football transfer markets. I can't speak as um, articulately as Matt did about the the way in which American finance might come into the um, European market. But I was recently, I spent a lot of time recently with uh, President Reutsch at Villarreal celebrating his 25th year um, of owning Villarreal, having bought them for 400,000 euros. And they remain in... Uh, and a population base of their named community of 50,000. And, you know, not a hell of a lot bigger when you include Castellón in it. And yet he is not pumping money into Villarreal the way that, for example, Abramovich was at Chelsea. Reutsch is not making losses. He has turned it into a, um, a self-sustaining club. There were times when he had to clear the debts and there were times when his billions, and he is a billionaire, Counted at the moment, that's not the case. And while they only finished seventh in La Liga, they went to their second Champions League final in in from a population of forty thousand, having had a stadium a couple of years before their first Champions League final, which really was housing about ten thousand people and wasn't fully covered. There are um, there are stories of of those who can buck the trend. But it sounds from the way in which Matt's predictions came across that they will become still more of an anomaly and, and maybe the one that's best I identifiable of, of where we are now, what might happen is Football Club Barcelona, whereby their presidential model in recent years has not been as robust or as successful as at Real Madrid. And beyond the 1.4 billion global debt, they're in a terrible mess about 
how to get out of it, how to modernise the club, given that they think that they need to invest 600 million in the stadium and the campus. Um, there is, There are terrible schisms because foolish people, they've tried to run it via a democracy. And the voters have voted absolutely idiotically twice in the last 12 years. So asterisk people, I don't mean this to hell with voting and socios and presidents and democracy. Let's just let the big dollar win and maybe <laughs> everything will be fine. God, I can hate this conversation <laughs> so much. Mark, could I ask you just and uh, very yeah. briefly if you can, because the clock is mm-hmm. starting to kill me here. I'm okay. not, I'm, I've just realised I'm not going to get to many of the things I plan to get to. Uh, I read a recent report estimating Newcastle could spend as much as 600 million in mm. a transfer window and still be within financial fair play rules. And I'm thinking of the other oil states here. Mm. Like, is there any likelihood that there will be a suppression on the spending that will actually be enforced? Uh, well, yeah, the answer's a bit like Graham's last sort of groan, really. Um, maybe. Okay. Um, look, the thing about Newcastle and their spending is they they have sort of stored up a lot of headwind, if you like, by by not spending very much. So they're absolutely fine in terms of, you know how like profits are a bit, well, FFP works in these sort of rolling three-year cycles. So they can, in theory, sort of go for it if they want to. I'm not quite sure about that top number, but but it, okay. look, they can really go for it uh, because they haven't gone for it for the last couple of years. But that really is in terms of the Premier League's rules. And of course, they're not quite ready to compete in Europe yet. So uh, they would have to be a little bit mindful of that, how quickly they want to start competing in Europe. But then, of course... UEFA's financial fair play rules will change in 2023 anyway, um, which will rein them in a bit. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why people like Javier Tevez and others quite like them. But um, it, it didn't work last time around, did it? So um, we shall see. Uh, this is not a particularly uh, cheerful question, but just it is worth uh, pulling in a few different things from the last uh, 12 months, I suppose. I'm thinking of the Euro 2020 final at Wembley. I'm thinking of Stade de France, which was very much mm. uh, on the authorities, I think we can safely say. At this stage, I'm thinking of uh, the unrest and, and pitch invasions across, in French football across the year. I'm thinking of uh, pieces we've done in the show this year whereby uh, Matt Lawton was on with us. He'd spent time with UK police who were noticing huge rise in uh, drug use in stadiums and uh, we've seen the spate of pitch invasions of late in UK football and the sense in Matt Lawton's piece from the UK police was that just this, there is this bubbling sense of, of, of something, I don't want to say hooliganism, I don't know what word to use, but this bubbling sense of something again in English football and they're slightly concerned. Any thoughts on that, Graeme? Or am I, yes. am I, am I yes. plucking together uh, di- different uh, things and, and, and uh, throwing them wrongly into the same melting pot? I've got a strong, passionate point of view, and an element in this. Um, therefore, uh, you know, an, an Atlantic drift in this is the fact that, for a long time, and increasingly so, most outlets are guilty of treating football as no more than a commodity, treating football managers, treating football players as little more than pawns in a game. It's it's rare. I think that you get a concerted and intelligent and well understood position that these are people that when a club is relegated, people can lose their livelihoods, jobs can be made redundant, that footballers who go through a pandemic are as um, entitled to say I'm mentally and emotionally broken as any worker ever was and Broadly, it links back to the early part of the discussion and your point about the internet, Joe, about um, fantastic super brand na- named players and agents and clothing companies making them into towering Marvel super and heroes and not real people. And therefore, why wouldn't you get hopped up? Why wouldn't you invade a pitch? Because they're not real. They don't matter. And anyway, they're so rich that their feelings and their well-being don't matter. What do you mean they're tired? They earn a lot of money. They can't be tired. We are teaching and have been teaching people for a long time. And the tide comes in and out and new you know, generations of youngsters who don't have the same ideas and values and experiences that three of us and many of your listeners have, gradually, in an erosive way, we are teaching people that football is nothing more than a 
commodity and it's it's throwaway and that's why we have garbage problems and recycling problems in the world because we don't care about the value and the importance of things and and in those situations people will get hopped up and invade the pitch and swing at footballers and 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 were i in charge you already know um people stewards would be would be given cattle prods and those who disobeyed would be put down and and my my daughter is an abolitionist in terms of jail sentences but i would have them in penal colonies on rainy rat infested islands and that would solve the problem pretty damn quickly okay well uh, you know hashtag me if you think i'm wrong i don't care uh i would love to throw that one around a little bit but as i knew would be the case we are completely out of time so unfortunately we are going to have to leave it there but my thanks to you both graham hard luck this evening on uh, the match at hamden Viva Ukraine. And Matt Slater from The Athletic. Thanks as ever, Matt. Much appreciated. No worries at all. We'll take a break.